Well, let's turn back to the passage that we read together in 1 Thessalonians. Just bow in prayer as you do so. Let the words of the psalmist be our prayer indeed tonight. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my Redeemer. Amen. A book came out some years ago called Adrift. It was a true story of a man who built a boat that he wanted to sail him across the Atlantic. It seemed that he hit bad weather after some weeks and the boat broke up. He was on a raft for about eight days before help came. He said the thing that kept him alive was hope. His lowest days, he said, was when he could see no hope and no possibility of rescue. His hope kept him going. Now it's been said that we can live 40 days without food, eight days without water, Four minutes without air, but not very long without hope. So what's hope? Well, the Oxford Dictionary says it's the expectation of something denied. Not a very good definition, is it? Another definition I read, it says wishing for an outcome and looking forward to something which may or may not be fulfilled. But you know, hope in the biblical sense, means more than just wishing something might happen. It's a confident expectation of looking forward to something we know will happen because God is in it. Now I'm told the Greek word that translates hope signifies something certain which though future can be anticipated eagerly and expectantly. Someone put it like this, that hope in one sense, is the biblical shorthand for unconditional certainty. That's a lot better definition. And of course, that Christian hope, as we've already been reminded tonight, is found only in Christ. That's why we sang at the beginning, in Christ alone, my hope is found. Now, back in the 1950s, early 50s, Billy Graham came to this country for one of his first crusades. And it seems that he met up with the Prime Minister at the time, Winston Churchill. And Winston, remember, this is not that long, many years after the war. Winston Churchill said to him, Mr. Graham, do you have hope for this troubled world? And Billy Graham said, yes, sir, I do. And that's in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, his death, his resurrection, and his coming again. Yes, sir, he said, I've got hope. And it's a hope that is sure and it's certain. So let's remind ourselves tonight of that hope that's found here in this passage in 1 Thessalonians 4. It's always good to remind ourselves of the context. The church at Thessalonica that Paul was writing to was a church that certainly stood out amongst other churches. It was a, a thriving and a spiritual church. Here were people that were certainly different, distinctive, and distinguished. Uh, This comes out even in the very first chapter, when Paul says to the believers there, he talks about their work, in verse 2, produced by faith, their labour prompted by love, and their endurance inspired by hope through our Lord Jesus Christ. And in that chapter, Paul speaks of these people, these believers, as an elect people, an exemplary people, an enthusiastic people, as well as an expectant people. His letter to them was to encourage them to keep walking with the Lord. But here, he also speaks about them meeting with the Lord. Yes, it's good for them to live well, but also important for them to die well. It's all about having, again, 
a blessed hope, whether we live or die. And having such a hope can help us to live for today in the light of looking forward to tomorrow. So what is that hope? It says in verse 17, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Whether we go to be with the Lord or whether he comes back for us, we will be with him forever. That's our eternal future. That's our blessed hope. But of course the Thessalonians had a problem. They were concerned about their loved ones who'd already died. Now Paul was evidently taught, had taught them that Jesus was going to return. And his return actually could be soon. And on his return, he would take his people to himself. So the question arose was, what about their loved ones who had died before Christ returned? What would happen to them? Would they be at a disadvantage? Would they miss out on this glorious event? In this passage, Paul answers their questions and bases his encouragement and in comfort on four fundamental truths. And the first truth is this. Firstly, the return, he says, of God's Son. Look what he says in verse 14. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring back with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Notice that God will bring back with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. It's a reminder to us that Jesus is coming back. Just as he came the first time, and so he will come the second time. Just as the Bible says. But the second time he would come differently. First time he came in obscurity and poverty, as we know. The second time he would come in glory and majesty. You and I tonight need to remind ourselves of this hope we have. Because his return, firstly, will be personal. He will return personally for his people. Those who have turned to him and those who have trusted in him. His return will also be physical. Remember in Acts 1.11, the angel said to the disciples then, this same Jesus will return. In human form, yet in glorified form. His return will be visible. There's going to be no secret return. Everyone will see his coming. It's the one event no one will miss. But his return will also be unpredictable. Come like a thief in the night. No one knows when he will come back. His return will be purposeful. He will restore all things, the Bible says. He will recreate the new heaven, the new earth, and he will reign with his people. His return, we have to say, will also be terrible for those who are not ready. In 2 Thessalonians 1 7, it says that he will punish those who do not know God and do not obey God. But of course his return will be wonderful for those who are ready and are right. We're told in 1 John 3, 2, we know that when he appears we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. What a prospect. What a future, what a hope we have. I mentioned Billy Graham a few moments ago. I always remember uh, seeing him being interviewed on television by David Frost. And David Frost said to him, Mr. Graham, are you a pessimist or an optimist? And he said to him, I'm an optimist. He said, why are you an optimist? He said, because I've read the last chapter of the Bible. And three times Jesus said, I am coming soon. And the hope of Christ's return should be the ultimate goal of our Christian life, the ultimate focus of our Christian faith, the ultimate destination of the Christian hope. It will be the end of life as we know it and the beginning of life yet to come. Apostle Paul actually spoke of Jesus' return at the end of each of the chapters of Thessalonians. When you get home, you can look at 
these chapters and look at the end of each chapter. It's all about Christ coming. For chapter 1, he relates it to our salvation. Chapter 2, to our service. Chapter 3, to our, our steadfast us and here. And chapter 4, to our sorrow. And note the words in verse 14. It talks about those who have fallen asleep. Now, this is not soul sleep, as some might think, but those who die in Christ. For on other occasions when a believer in Christ died, we read they went to be with Christ, which is far better. We see that in 2 Corinthians 5, 8 and Philippines 1, 23. So when he talks about falling asleep, simply it means falling into the arms of our Saviour. What did Jesus say to the thief on the cross? Today you'll be with me in paradise. So the logical conclusion from verse 14 and 15 is that God could not bring them with Jesus unless they were with him. And so it's a comfort for these believers that their loved ones were now with the Lord and one day would come back when he returned. And for ourselves here tonight, it's a comfort for us, isn't it? And assurance to know that whenever our fellow believers, our loved ones die, we know where they are now. A pastor was speaking to a, a friend at a conference whose wife had died recently. He said to him, he said, I'm very sorry to hear that you've lost your wife. He said, well, thank you very much for that. He said, but I haven't lost her, for I know where she's gone. He believes she's with the Lord and she would return with the Lord when he came back. I was reading of a five-year-old girl who was watching her big brother die of a very painful disease. And after he died, she asked her mum, Mum, where did my brother go? And mum says, he went to heaven to be with Jesus. Later on, a few days after the funeral, uh, the little girl noticed her mum was with her friend and she was sobbing. She said, oh, I've lost my son, I've lost my son. Later on, the little girl went up to her and said, Mummy, is somebody really lost when you know where they've gone? There's a wake-up call for a mum. Of course, she was still painful, but she needs to be reminded of the hope, the return of God's son. The second truth we see here is the resurrection of God's people. It says in verse 30, uh, in this passage, the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Here we see there is no possibility that those who died in Christ will ever be separated from him. They die through him, they sleep in him, they will rise with him. But it's only in Christ such a hope is found. Remember what Jesus said in John 11:25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And because Jesus rose from the dead, so those in Christ will also rise from the dead. Of course, we have that lovely passage, don't we, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, that resurrection passage, where it says there, when we'll be raised, we will be changed. It will happen in a moment, twinkling of an eye. We will be given new bodies. The body of humiliation will become the body of glorification. That which at the moment is corruptible will put on incorruption. And that which God began in eternity past will be complete in our eternal future. We need to remind ourselves tonight, do you know, if we're, if we're true Christians here tonight, we're believers in Christ, we need to see we are now a resurrected people. We're resurrected people. We were once dead spiritually. We're now alive spiritually. And God did it. I love that passage in Ephesians 2, verse 1, where Paul says to the believers there, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. And then verse 4, he says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you've been saved. My friends, we are resurrected people because of God's grace and nothing else. 
that have been raised with Christ spiritually we will reign with Christ eternally. So that's the second truth, the resurrection of God's people. The third one is the rapture of God's church. It says in verse 17, after that we who are alive and are, are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now the word rapture is not used here, but that's the literal meaning of being caught up. It means to seize, to carry off. Why is Jesus coming back? He's coming back for his church, the bride of Christ. He's coming back, in other words, for you and me, if we belong to Christ and if we know him. Remember what Jesus said to the disciples, I will come back and take you to be with me. What a glorious event that's going to be. The one who called us to himself in this life, He's going to come back and take us to be with himself in glory. Now, another meaning to be caught up is to rescue from danger. And some have suggested that this means that the church will be taken up before the great tribulation occurs. I have to say I don't see enough evidence to suggest that here. Uh, remember, at this moment, many believers, as already been reminded in Christ, are going through terrible tribulations. And also Jesus never suggested in the Gospels that we would escape trials, troubles, or tribulations. In fact, he promised the very opposite. And in John 16, he said, in the world, you will have trouble. It will come our way. So the rapture of the church gives us a, a, a glorious hope to know that one day we're going to be caught up to meet with the Lord himself. And yet, if we want to be those that will be called up to be with Christ, then we need to make sure that we are those that have come to Christ now in this life by faith and put our trust in him. I love the lovely promise that Jesus gave in John 5, 24. He said, I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. So what do you happen? If you're a Christian here tonight and you put your trust in Christ, you've already crossed over from death to life. That's why we have a hope that's sure and certain for us. So we've seen the return of God's Son. We've been reminded of the resurrection of God's people, the rapture of God's church. Let's not forget the reunion of God's family. It says in verse 18, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Here we have this everlasting fellowship. Here the descendant Lord and the ascendant saints meet together. Great reminder of the encouragement and comfort we need. For though death is a great separator, in Jesus we have a great reconciler. We're not always not only be those we'll just be reunited with each other, but the most important thing, we will be reunited with Christ. Here we walk by faith then that faith will be turned into sight. What it reminds us, haven't we, in John 3, 2, where it says, we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Imagine that. Be like him, and we shall see him. Now, I don't know what your thoughts on heaven here tonight are, but for me, when I think of heaven, I just want to see and be with my Saviour. That's all I want. And that should be our long in this world, shouldn't it? The old hymn says, face to face with Christ my Saviour. Face to face, what would it be? When with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ, he died for me. Face to face, oh blissful moment. 
face to face to see and know, face to face with my Redeemer, Jesus Christ, who loves me so. Face to face shall I behold him. Far beyond the starry skies, face to face in all his glory, I shall see him by and by. What a moment. What a day that will be. <laughs> I might surprise you. I was going to sing you a song. I'm not going to sing it now. There's a lovely song, gospel song called What a Day It Will Be. It's a lovely song. Perhaps another time I might sing it. But uh, I, I've got a dry mouth and uh, I don't want to ruin your evening. Um, but you know, thinking about this hope, you know, I do believe that one of the sure signs of a healthy Christian is the anticipation and longing for this glorious hope of Christ's return and that longing to be with him. If that's not so for us tonight, then we have to say, perhaps, just perhaps, we just might be too comfortable in this world by having no desire to leave it yet. But when a Christian grows and loves the Lord more and more, the only, they not only look for his appearing, but they long for that appearing and they love the thought of his appearing. That's the blessed hope we have. Whether we live or die, we will be with the Lord forever. So let's close. And let me close by reminding us of what we read in verse 18. It says, Therefore encourage each other with these words. And we need encouragement, don't we? When we see the world around us getting worse and worse, we can say to each other, don't worry, Jesus is coming and we will be with him. When the going is tough and difficult and hard, we can say, hang in there, Jesus is coming and we shall be with him. When we might feel defeated, discouraged, disillusioned in the conflict, we can say, one day we will overcome for Jesus is coming and we will be with him. When we might feel rejected, perhaps of no use anymore, we can say, don't lose heart for Jesus is coming and we shall be with him. And even when we say farewell, to loved ones. Life might not seem worth living. We can say it won't last for Jesus is coming and we shall be with him. Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's people. We belong to him. We are being kept by him. One day we shall be with him. What a hope we have. Do you know when John Owen, the great Puritan preacher, lay on his deathbed, he got his secretary to write a farewell letter to a friend of his. And this is what he got her to write. Dear sir, I am still in the land of the living. Ha, huh, that's not right, he said. Start again. Dear sir, I am still in the land of the dying. I will soon be in the land of the living. What a hope. Soon to be in the land of the living. Such a hope, as we said at the beginning, is found only in Christ. That's what we sing. I sang earlier, in Christ alone, my hope is found. Remember the last words of that song? The power of hell, no scheme of man, can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ. I stand. Let's encourage each other with those words. Christ is our hope in life and death. Amen.